This episode of To The Journey is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for your smartphone, tablet and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the non-profit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. Want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hi, I'm Manu Reme. I played Ichev on Star Trek Voyager and you're listening to Trek FM. I think it's safe to say that no one on this crew has been more obsessed with getting home than I have. But when I think about everything we've been through together, maybe it's not the destination that matters. Maybe it's the journey. If that journey takes a little longer, so we can do something we all believe in. I can't think of any place I'd rather be or any people I'd rather be with. To the journey. You're here. To the journey. 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 Hello everybody at home and welcome. This is To the Journey. I'm your co-host, Suzanne Williamson, and with me, as always, are... Zachary Fruling and... Kay Shaw. Today, we will be discussing Voyager's kings of sarcasm and snark and their relationship, talking about the Doctor and Tom Paris. Yay, I'm really excited about this one. I love these two. I love the Doctor and Tom Paris. It's like the Voyager comedy hour. When I was a, a little kid, I used to watch like these old comedy shows like Laurel and Hardy and Abbott and Costello and maybe like The Odd Couple too. And I could ima- totally imagine Tom and the Doctor having their own comedy show. Yeah. Oh, they're definitely The Odd Couple. <laughs> definitely. I could actually kind of picture it like this little black and white TV show they would show on Tom's television set. Yeah. <laughs> they'd, they'd have like their own little version instead of a briefing with Neelix. And they'd get in there. They'd have to film it from the holodeck because they'd get in there and they'd be like, computer, change spectral frequency. <laughs> and they'd go black and white and then... Can you imagine if they had done that on the holodeck in black and white instead of Captain Proton? Like a Tom, Tom and uh, the Doctor's like, stand-up show or Absolutely, Laurel and Hardy hour. type show. What would the theme song be? Because they need a theme song. Bo- Booze and Buddies. Booze and Buddies. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking Perfect Strangers. Oh yeah, like, like totally. Which one would be Balky? That's the doctor. <laughs> oh, the doctor's Balky, definitely. <laughs> Were we recasting again? <laughs> yes. I'm not sure Tom Paris is like Cousin Larry, really. <laughs> but the doctor's a bit more like Balky. The doctor's definitely more like Balky. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> We have totally lost Kay. You lost me, sorry. (laughs) You have to watch this show. All kidding aside, I do really love the Doctor's banter with Tom Paris. You know, basically their entire interaction consists of ribbing each other and, you know, taking little pot shots. But it's all in good fun because they really do like each other. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Do you have some counterexamples? I do. I have a whole bunch of counterexamples. Let's get going. (laughs) Because Kay did her homework. Once in a while, we see Tom kind of counseling the doctor, getting him to realize something about humanity a few times, actually. But it's always almost always followed by a joke, right? No. No. It's not. And actually, despite everything that you've said, which I do agree with, and I think the general nature of their relationship is like that. As a result of doing this, I've actually come to the conclusion that they have some of the most profound scenes in the whole of Voyager between the two of them. Well, do tell. What's the first one on your list? Well, where are we going to... Oh, yeah. I've got to pick one now. Don't keep us in suspense, Kay. Do tell. I, I'm totally open to the possibility that I'm just not giving Tom and the Doctor enough credit. Because they do, there's some great moments. They do counsel each other in some ways. So I'm not, I don't want to make light of that. But it's all very lighthearted to me. The one-liner type stuff is very lighthearted, yeah. They have a lot of like one-liner type quips and, and back and forth, but I think the proper 
scenes between the two of them. A lot of those are really intense. I'm gonna. Do you want me to start off then? I'm. I'm gonna kick yeah, yeah, off with a scene from Year of Hell. Then it's towards the end of the first part where we've got Balana in sick bay and Tom's treating her. Well, it's not sick bay in the mess hall kind of sick bay thing that they've created, and Tom's treating her and the doctor's asking him to go and see to somebody else and obviously he doesn't want to because he's trying to reassure her and sort of make her make her feel better and he's like no she's not the only patient that we've got and he's trying to persuade him away and then they kind of get into a bit of a not not an argument over it but but tom just sort of backbites at him and he's like physician heal thyself after the doctor says to him oh you could be seeing more of your friends in here but then we get this whole confession from the from the doctor about how he's seen the two people die in the in the incident that had happened earlier where he's had to seal off the other deck and they didn't get out in time and stuff and he and he talks about that and it's just they have a they have a moment bit of a moment between the two of them and i i quite like that he just seems to be like despite the superficial nature that their relationship seems to have a lot of the time that they seem to open up to each other a lot well they're stuck down there in sickbay together <laughs> it didn't take a lot for t- tom to get him to actually admit what's going on i think that's the thing that's most interesting because they do have this lighthearted banter most of the time but they spend a lot of time together down in sick bay mm-hmm. and so they have developed this kind of weird odd couple bond where they can open up to each other in ways they can't really open up to other members of the crew when the stakes are higher when something is going yeah. on so it says something about my personality that i actually picked something from year of hell part one as well but oh. the, <laughs> yeah i love the one-liner that when the doctor basically says who would have thought that this eclectic group of voyagers could actually become a family starfleet maquis klingon talaxian hologram borg even mr paris <laughs> <laughs> i just love the look that tom gives him <laughs> even mr powers tom gives him this great look like what the hell <laughs> <laughs> what was that for what did i do I do love that. It sums their banter up really well, actually, because the Doctor really just loves to imply that... I don't even know what he's trying to imply about Tom half the time, but he's just trying to imply that Tom is just sort of like some wastrel kind of guy who's just bumming around the ship, never pulling his weight and all the rest of it. I love it. (laughs) Tom's reply just reinforces the close nature of their friendship because he could have taken it personally, but instead he just shoots him a look like, hey, what did I do? Yeah. Don't zing me like that. (laughs) So another one of my favorite scenes, and this is, I think, along the lines of what you had to say, Kay, that they they understand each other and they can look into each other's interior in some way that other members of the crew can't. Um, It's from the episode Someone to Watch Over Me when the Doctor kind of has a crush on Seven of Nine, and it takes Tom Paris to recognize that you're really kind of acting like you've got a crush on her. (laughs) There's a couple of bits, actually. There's a part from the sort of middle of the episode where... He he sort of I think it's when they're setting up the date with Chapman or whatever his name is. And um Tom's saying about oh all the potential pitfalls of trying to get seven to date and, and the AMH is defending her. Yeah, that's the scene I have in mind because yeah, he says something like, it sounds like you're getting a little infatuated with your star pupil. And he takes it personally, like, infatuated? That's absurd, which yeah. totally highlights the truth of the matter, you know. And then, and then Tom just says, whatever you say, maestro. <laughs> I love it. It was part of the lesson plan. <laughs> I I love that. And I like the bit later on as well, actually, in that episode, which is probably the slightly more sweet moment between the two of them, where at that point, the doctor's asking him, hypothetically, if you get romantic feelings for someone, how do you normally like express them, etc.? It's for one of Seven's lessons. And I love that Tom totally understands because that's kind of like, that's how you talk, right? Hypothetical. I've yeah. got a question about a friend, right? Yeah. It's not about me. Oh, no, 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 no. It's about a friend. Yeah. And then and then they have this whole hypothetical conversation about it. And then just as he's about to leave, Tom just goes, why don't you just tell her? <laughs> <laughs> I love that because he's perceptive. I give Tom Paris that, if nothing else. He's perceptive. But Tom's been perceptive about uh, the doctor's romantic inclinations before because he was that way when um, when the doctor had a thing for Dinara Pell. Yes. Oh, yeah. In life science. Tom sees all. I mean, that's one of the first really proper conversations we get with them, actually. Up until that point, I think. there's the, We get the one-liners and stuff, but I think this is the first time they actually <laughs> have a proper talk. I like, I like that scene. Yeah, is that the first time they really kind of... I think so, yeah. I would say bond with each other, have a real conversation. 
Well, I think it's the first time we actually see the MH admit that Tom might have something useful to say. <laughs> actually listen. <laughs> yeah. So he actually, like, goes to him for advice about women. Well, who else would you go to? You're not going to go to Harry. <laughs> It gets into quite a nice deep conversation, but I just really like the fact that it starts up with him going, oh, Miss Paris, I was looking for you. And then and then he says, I assume you've had a great deal of experience being rejected by women. <laughs> <laughs> so even though he's looking for advice, he's got to get that, that snark right in there. That totally makes my point, though, that even when they have a serious conversation, there's always a zinger in there somewhere. Not always, but in this instance, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say this is a particularly sort of emotional conversation but you know the doctor's wanting a bit of bit of advice it gets emotional advice, towards the end right? advice it does get yeah. emotional towards the end of this one when he starts talking about oh you never really get over them and then he just starts getting really the doctor's just like oh, <laughs> and he gets this like really wistful look on his face it is kind of interesting like who on voyager would you go to for advice tom is actually one of the people i mean you might go to chakotay you wouldn't go to harry kim <laughs> For women? No, never. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, right? You know, you gotta... I'd go to Bolana first. <laughs> what? You would go to Bolana for advice about women? Before Harry, yeah. <laughs> it does make sense to actually go to a woman for advice on about women. But... Well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of depends what the nature of the advice is, but... Uh... I'd even go to Naomi before Harry. Yeah, <laughs> Naomi would cut right through the chase and give the doctor the straight scoop. Yeah. Sweets. He'd be like, just be nice to her. Sweets is where it's at, Always. I'd say. But it's quite interesting that we've kind of stepped from from the someone to watch over me to, to that because it, it shows that the doctor really talked to Tom about his romantic interests and that was an ongoing thing. E- either that or Tom just stuck his oar in. <laughs> but it was certainly something that, you know, they, they discussed on a number of occasions. That was the person that he would talk to about that kind of thing. So I find that interesting. Despite their, I don't, I don't know whether to call it a love hate relationship. It's not really a love hate. No, I don't think it's. I don't. I don't even think it's a hate relationship. That's not it. Yeah, it's like a friendly sort of friendly antagonism. It's very British. It's very British. Their relationship. Yeah, that kind of. It's very much like my family. We're constantly picking on ribbing each other. Constantly picking on each other. Yeah, yeah. But it, but it's actually kind of a sign of affection. In a weird yeah, it's way. Yeah, it's all very ironic because yeah, you know, it's that, a sign of affection. But Because yeah, it, if we didn't care, we wouldn't pick. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's really British, actually. It's it it's quite funny because I've I've known a few people from, from the States that have been over here and they just don't get it to start with. It's like everybody's so horrible to each other all the time. <laughs> and they're like, do you actually like each other? And it's like, yeah, this is just how we relate. <laughs> do you think that some of that is Bob Picardo's like theater background Maybe. coming into into play? Possibly. Could be. It's so interesting because it feels like it's there right from the start. I mean, like we don't we don't see an awful lot that leads up to that relationship starting and manifesting <laughs> itself. It's like it's it almost comes out the box fully formed, and yet it it just makes sense for them straight away. When you can see why they paired them up together in sick bay because mm. it was working so well, you know, when you know because they didn't have m- yeah. much of a reason to be in the same room very often, and once they realized they could do these little one line zingers, and it was always funny. It's like, well, let's put them down in sick bay together, and we yeah. do it all the time. Yes. <laughs> let's put our best pilot in sick bay because that makes, makes so much sense. sense. Well, I think it might be what what you're saying actually, Zach, which was it was more it was more of a sort of out of character writing type mm. decision rather than a made sense in universe type decision and it was it's complex because it's not just the comedy it's that they really do have this kind of rapport where they can mm. open up to each other when they need to so you know from a writing standpoint you can totally see why they put those two characters together and you know give them as much time as possible because then we can really flesh out those characters so who would the doctor not open up to like he opens up to tom he opens up a little bit. To, like, definitely opens up to Seven of Nine in some ways, although he kind of shields his real feelings. Neelix? <laughs> yeah, the Doctor and Neelix don't open up. That's true. Not really. No. What if they'd made Neelix the medic? Oh, God, <laughs> that would have been weird. <laughs> Neelix has bedside manner. It would have been okay. Oh, he would have been redecorating sick bay. He definitely would have had to have more baths. <laughs> But he loves his bubble bath. <laughs> to me, it's kind of the same thing as, as Neelix and Tuvok, right? The reason those two always have a banter is because they have that subtlety, right? They can yeah. rib each other and then they can kind of open up when they need to. And Tom and the Doctor, the same exact yeah. kind of pair- pairing. Mm-hmm. 
It's kind of a similar type of dynamic, although I tend to feel that Tom and the Doctor, there's more there on an emotional front underneath it. I think Neelix, Neelix and Tuvok, they they essentially do like each other underneath it, but I don't I don't know whether it's quite the same level of emotional bond that I think the Doctor and Tom have. Well, that and th- and throughout the entire run, both the Doctor and Tom are constantly growing. Yes, as people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they had more growing to do than than Tuvok or Neelix. True. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So another one that I really like which is a bit more of a sort of intense one is in the episode latent image which is the episode where the, they've had to wipe the doctor's memory of the fact that he let somebody die because it's messing him up and mm. his moral subroutines and stuff it's actually a flashback um to when it when the incident happened in the first place uh and tom paris is there at the time and we get this bit of the scene where they're talking about choosing who it is that they're going to save um and i I just really like how the doctor's kind of flapping about it and you know tom tom just kind of goes you just need to pick one because otherwise we're going to lose both of them and there's there's just this intensity and i i just the two of them working together in sick bay and and you know trying to trying to save someone and then we get the bit where they've managed to save harry and then they've got the other the other girl on the bed i forget her name but they've got the other lieutenant on the bed and she's sort of the monitor goes to say that she's she's died and then they you just get this little it's not even a verbal exchange between them just this little like non-verbal exchange between them where they just kind of look at each other and they're like uh and and tom almost kind of looks at the doctor like look you didn't have a choice and he he almost says that without even saying it i just they communicate really nicely non-verbally as well I, I've spotted that in a few different places, actually, but this is a really good example of it, where they can just sort of convey that between them, the feeling, without really saying it. That flashback scene is brilliant because mm. it shows how much Tom has really developed as, as a person. He's cool under pressure, right? It's a crisis yeah. situation. He's the one saying, deal with the situation at hand, pick one. And it shows how good of a medic he's become to be able to do that. And he is the one to kind of snap the doctor back into reality. It's like, you need to pick one now. It's an emergency. Yeah. I think that's just a great character moment for Tom. Like only only a, a, a genuine adult can can behave that cool under pressure. And here we get Tom being the cool under pressure guy. Yeah, because I mean we're into like season five at this point, so there's been a lot of <laughs> there's been a lot of high pressure moments over which he sort of developed that and, and grown. You'd think the Doctor would be able to do that automatically because of his programming, but because of the conflict in his mm. ethical subroutines, he he was having this kind of internal breakdown. He couldn't he couldn't be the cool guy under pressure like he's programmed to be. Yeah, but Tom's not always the cool guy under pressure when it comes to Milana. No, because in of course Oblivion, when she dies and and he keeps trying to do like the injections, and the Doctor's like, no, we have to stop. She's gone. There's yeah. nothing more we can do. He's like, you have to save her. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I I love that. She's his kind of his strength and his weakness as well in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. But it's great because he's the doctor is the one he's pleading to, right? He's mm. pleading. He the Tom is not cool under pressure. He's in a crisis, right? And he's pleading to the doctor, save her. Yeah, it's it's interesting that I think as as just a little scene because I I know anybody would kind of do that in that situation if that's the person that you love and, you know, there's somebody there who's a medical professional and so on. But, I mean, in this context, you know, Tom is also a medical professional and he's been doing the job for quite Mm -hmm. a few years. And we've heard it said on a few occasions that, you know, he's he's almost as, as capable at doing all of the normal routine stuff as the doctor is by this point. So for him to kind of have that still level of faith in him, even though he knows what's gone on and he's aware of the condition that she's in, that he still has that faith in the doctor that the doctor can do something. That's nice. I like that. I I think that shows that quite nicely. We see the fact that actually in some ways he does look up to him, even though he would never admit it. No, no, he'd never admit that. <laughs> I was kind of just chuckling to myself about your description of Tom as a medical professional. It just makes me say snicker <laughs> well, a little bit. he is, bit. essentially, by this <laughs> yeah, point. On paper, yeah, absolutely. And he's doing the job, and he's he's actually good at it, too. But it's mm. just like, I don't think of Tom as yeah. a quote-unquote medical professional, right? Yeah, because when they lose the doctor, they turn to Tom. Mm. 
You just got a promotion, Tom. No more piloting that ship for you. He can fly it from sick bay, right? They have a computer console down there in sick bay. Can't you picture him like hanging out in the doctor's he office? Set up actually? a joystick. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like flying the ship from the doctor's office. He could do that. Just all they need to do is reroute the little L cars things. There's no need to actually be sitting up on the bridge, no. No, and we could all he needs is a screen and some buttons. <laughs> <laughs> That is all it takes to fly the ship. Poo poo to Tom with his excellent piloting skills. All it takes is a screen and some buttons. No, I, I couldn't fly a ship with a screen and some buttons, takes, but Tom then could. Why did Troy keep, you know, crashing? Oh my gosh. Products. How do. Oh. No, I'm not saying Troy could fly a ship with the screen and some buttons. Tom can. <laughs> I'm not sure he can fly the ship and stop people from dying at the same time. Well, if it if he makes it a joystick, then he just needs the one hand to steer and he can use the other hand to like inject the hyposprays. He could do both for a short amount of time. <laughs> Very short. I got one hand on the joystick and the other one's giving a hypospray. <laughs> <laughs> It's just such a funny mental picture, though. Like Tom's sitting there in the doctor's office. He's got a little joystick and he's, you know, flying the <laughs> ship around. <laughs> Like a little hyper spray pops up out of the out of the desk, and that's the the, the joystick. He's driving the ship with a hypo spray, <laughs> something like that. We'll work out the details later. That that'll be in the progenitors too. Excellent, yes. good. Add Tom, at its list. <laughs> yes, Tom flies <laughs> Voyager ship. with a yeah. Tom flies the ship with a uh, hyper spray. I hope joystick. somebody's keeping notes of all these things we say from the sick bay too. <laughs> Until the Vidians show up and the Vodwar and the Vulcans <laughs> and anybody else that starts with V. Yeah. Do you know, we're, we're joking here about, about Tom taking over essentially from the Doctor, but actually, in Virtuoso, we do see that get discussed. Mm-hmm, we and, do. and I love that scene as well. That's a great scene between the two of them because Tom just can't believe the fact that he's going to actually go and be like, you know, opera dude for these people. Opera dude. Opera dude. <laughs> he basically says, you're not really going to go through with this, are you, Doc? Yeah, but it's the way that he sort of says it as well. And like, he, he's genuinely like, are you serious? Like, you, you, you're going to do this? And then he says, who am I going to torment after you're gone? Which I thought was really nice. And then <laughs> the doctor sort of goes and he just says this little sad, I'll be here redecorate your office. And it's just like, actually got like a bit of a feels moment there like tom would genuinely miss him bolano would be like oh good finally like, somewhere to put this television set get that thing out of here put <laughs> it in the doctor's <laughs> office in sick bay just get all of tom's junk into sick bay yeah. <laughs> take your toaster with you but it's just another little bit where we see that actually you know that all this all this ribbing it's it's all very affectionate Really? It's all their way of kind of relating to each other, but actually they really care. And I just think that's nice. Well, they'd never admit it, though. You know, that's what's fun no. about it. No, never. Even in Endgame, in the alternate future, when the doctors finally pick the name and it's Joe, Tom goes, Joe? <laughs> all those years to pick Joe? I love that. You know, <laughs> what's his last name? Van Gogh. Yes. That's what I want to know. <laughs> We've Joe already Van decided Gogh. that. That's already in the head canon. <laughs> But yeah, I just love the I just love the absolutely incredulous. It took you thirty three years to come up with Joe. Just call me Doctor Joe. It's beautiful. I absolutely love it. It's kind of perfect as well. You remember that movie from the nineties? You've got mail. Yeah. Yes, it was a remake. Yeah, absolutely. You remember when Tom Hanks' character he's in, he's in the little bookstore and he's spelling his name. And he goes Joe. Just call me Joe. <laughs> And the little and the little kid comes up and goes F O X Joe Fox. O-X. I can picture like the doctor going, just call me Joe. D D O C Doctor Joe. So Kay, as usual, you did all of the homework and you have a list of like twenty <laughs> yeah. Tom and Doctor moments. I see. I didn't do my homework. I came up with a list of like three. What can I say? I like to be prepared. I know you do. I'm a good little Girl Scout. You even made a spreadsheet. I know you. I don't have a spreadsheet for this specifically, but I have extensive notes. Well, I'm really disappointed now. I'm shocked, shocked, shocked. But insofar as you did do your homework and nearly made a spreadsheet, what do you have next for a Tom and EMH moment? Well, I think actually I'm going to go into talking about author, author, because there's a couple of moments in this episode. But the one that I really wanted to talk about is I think it's probably the only time we actually see Tom and the Doctor have a proper stand-up row 
like a proper full-on slanging match argument because we we sort of get obviously the doctor's made his his hollow novel photons be free as he calls it and and he's modeled some of the characters on some of the crew as we know and as they're sort of seeing it they're getting increasingly unhappy about this so tom makes some changes to the program in order to highlight to the doctor <laughs> how ridiculous what he's done is by you know making the doctor in there which isn't actually technically the doctor do some <laughs> do some stuff that the doctor wouldn't necessarily want him to be doing in in a story and in order for tom to be able to make his point so can i do my impersonation of tom doing the impersonation you can. of the doctor Okay, here it goes. <laughs> Your job will be to assist the chief medical officer and learn to tolerate his overbearing behavior and obnoxious bedside manner. Remember, patience is a virtue. <laughs> <laughs> that was me impersonating Tom, impersonating the doctor. I like it. I like what you did there. That was good. <laughs> but it's just the doctor. The doctor just gets all up in arms about it. Like you've just destroyed a work of art that took me months to create and all this, and he, he gets all all angry about it and they gradually sort of get more and more acrimonious towards each other and he's mad about what tom's done to the program and tom's like well you wouldn't want people to actually think this is you or maybe you should think about how everybody else feels and they're just screaming at each other in the corridor and it just gets Uh really heated and yeah I, i had to pull that one out because they really go at it and Tom's really trying to teach the Doctor a lesson here that he thinks the Doctor's just got so involved in the fact that he wants to be this famous author and as we've said before you know his primp and his pride and his pomposity and all the rest of it and he just wants to be the big I am and he just gets blind to the fact that what he's doing isn't necessarily the most ethical thing. Well he's throwing his friends under under the bus to get there. Yeah and they've tried to explain it to him so Tom kind of takes these sort of somewhat more extreme measures to try and make a point to him. I'm sorry did you mean Lieutenant Marseille? Yes I do mean Lieutenant Marseille beg your pardon. (laughs) But it goes into this section where after they've had this bit of an argument he goes well what worries me is if this is how you see me that's what Tom says to the doctor he's like is this how is this how you see me you know and he says oh well obviously you're nothing like marseille he's self-indulgent and mature and and that's at the point where the doctor realizes what he's done Mm -hmm. and then tom just like comes back with this devastating comeback which is just like i'm surprised you noticed you know i thought i'd started to earn your respect but perhaps i was wrong and it's just like wow talk about arrow to the heart okay it's not nice for the doctor to put it in his hollow novel but in his defense isn't it all just a little bit true i mean hasn't he hasn't he latched onto these personality traits of of his his friends and comrades and exaggerated them and put them in his novel yeah but he's also overblown them oh totally totally absolutely but he's not he's not like totally making it up it's based on a kernel of truth about the characters yeah it is but tom's point is the fact that that is how he used to be and now he's grown and he's not the same person as he was before he's he's got responsibility now you know he's got family he's started to really make something of himself and he's left a lot of that behind and seeing that makes him think well what are you saying are you saying as far as you're concerned i haven't changed i haven't i haven't grown in the way that i thought that you'd seen from me i thought that i'd gained some respect from you because you'd seen that i'd changed am i mistaken and i just well, that's like a two great ways scene. of reading i love this. that scene it might even be my favorite actually there's there's like two ways of reading this right one way is that tom is just plain offended that the doctor sees him this way and he doesn't see himself that way anymore the other way of reading this is that tom is a little embarrassed maybe about how he used to be yeah and doesn't want to be reminded of it yes i think that is true as well and there is an element of that but the thing that i take the most from this is he says oh well i thought i'd started to earn your respect now if he says that to me that means that he thinks that the doctor's respect is something worth earning and it was something that he wanted to have so that says a lot about their relationship to me it says that tom always respected the doctor yeah exactly deep down inside yeah yeah so that's what I really take from this. And everything that you said is is absolutely right. But that's what I really take from it, that we, we get this admission from Tom that actually he wanted to earn the Doctor's respect and he thought that he got it. And he's really affronted by the fact that actually maybe the Doctor hasn't recognized everything that he's achieved. Once Tom calls him out on it, the Doctor does lavish him yeah. with some praise. He says, oh, he you're does. a family man now and you're a great medic, medic and all these all these compliments to him. And he really means those, I think. Because I think he really is very personally hurt by 
how the doctors portrayed him in that story. Well, it's not really nice. Oh, it's not very nice. Be? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> not the doctor's nicest moment. No. But I love the way that that's done. And they wouldn't get angry with each other unless they cared. Because people don't have rows with people that they're indifferent to. They only have rows with people that they actually have feelings towards. Inside that episode, I love their sort of opposite portrayal of each other inside the inside the the program. Like we get to see Lieutenant Marseille, and we get to see the Doctor acting acting differently. Yeah, the Doctor with more hair. Yes. Doctor with more hair. Yes, not behaving the way that we would like to see him behave, but <laughs> it all goes a bit sideways, doesn't it? I guess it doesn't really technically count as a Tom and Doctor moment inside the the hollow novel, but it's awesome. Well, I don't know. Alternate versions of people still count as moments. It never stopped before. The whole theme yeah. of Voyager is it never really happened, right? <laughs> well, you know, in his most ultimate terms, none of it really happened. <laughs> That's true. Hey. Says sorry. But just... it's going to happen. It's going it to happen. It hasn't happened yet. There you go. Yet. Except for when they went back to 1990-something. That's happened. Yeah, you might be Captain Janeway's great, 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 great grandmother, Suzanne. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. If, if cool. you say so, I'll take it. Are you secretly Shannon O'Donnell? <laughs> Where were you around the millennium? Um, not in the Midwest. Oh, okay. Sorry. Maybe not then. Yeah. Maybe on the other side of the family. You're from the other side of the family, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So there is, a, there is another scene actually earlier in that episode, which... I just wanted to pull out just because we, we get this exchange between them talking about how the Doctor wants to send his his novel off to the Alpha Quadrant to be published. Mm-hmm. I, first of all, I have to say I really like the fact that we get the little Dixon Hill reference. Yay! Because he Dixon says he's Hill. sending it to the publishers of Dixon Hill. So I just, I really like that we get a little a little TNG reference there. That's just really nice. I love little references like that. And then we also get um, this bit where he's like, Oh, well, you know, it's about the inventions of an intrepid doctor. And, and then Tom's like, oh, I'll send off. I might send Captain Proton and see what they think of that. And he just goes, well, they deal in sophisticated literature. <laughs> <laughs> Dixon Hill is up there with sophisticated literature. This, it's like the worst pulp novel ever that the doctor has written. Oh, yeah. But I, I love the ongoing sort of really love-hate relationship that the doctor has with Captain Proton. Because, you know, <laughs> he, he loves Captain Proton, really. But he pretends he doesn't love Captain of Proton. Of course he does. He got to be president of he Earth. He did get to be president of Earth, which, yeah, I love And that. have his spectral frequency adjusted. Yeah, which is, which is true. <laughs> despite the fact that there aren't actually very many Tom and the Doctor moments really in Bride of Chaotica. But we do get a little moment at the beginning of Night when we see Tom and Harry playing captain proton which i really like when the doctor shows up and he's like i've got this opera to rehearse you're three minutes over your time (laughs) he he literally walks into the program and he's just like well they're still playing and everything and then tom tries to say that they're studying sociology by playing it (laughs) wouldn't it be cool if you could adjust spectral frequency in real life like i could just turn back the clock on some of these gray hairs that'd be awesome (laughs) i wouldn't know anything about gray hair (laughs) (laughs) I just love the doctor going, this program is a waste of photonic energy. (laughs) Adjust the podcaster's spectral frequency, please. Well, I I still have like one really kind of emotional bit to talk about, but I think I'm going to hang fire on that one until until the end, maybe. But I've got there. There are some more little kind of chuck away bits that are really nice. I really like this bit from the beginning of Nothing Human, where we've got the doctor showing his his hollow vids. And he pulls up this video of Tom Paris covered in mud. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> it's like a family photo. It's awesome. I absolutely love it. And we just get this like, oh, this happened. off screen, And you know somebody's written that fanfic. In fact, I think I've read at least one version of, of that fanfic. But I just really like the line. It's just a great line. Here you are after your unfortunate slip into the fetid mud pits of Palomar. <laughs> You know, it just looks like th- th- this is the thing I love about Voyager. This this is Voyager being a family. Like every family photo album has these wacky pictures where someone, someone fell in the mud or someone's got whatever. cake Definitely. on their face or something, right? And this is this is the Voyager family album. Yeah, but I just love the fact that because of the nature of the relationship, that it, when he's doing a slideshow like that, who's it going to be other than Tom that's fallen in the mud? No one. <laughs> not 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 Chakotay. <laughs> 
and then he says hey i was pushed and and that's it that's all we get and i love that because it's like you can just fill in all the details whatever you like yeah did the doctor push him was it the doctor was mm. it harry was it was it someone else was it somebody else on this was it chakotay captain Par- yeah, janeway chakotay. chakotay pushed him in the mud <laughs> janeway gave him a good shove into the pool you know <laughs> tom paris made an ill-timed indian related joke and chakotay just went Pff. <laughs> just like that with like one arm because they were just walking along beside the fetid mud pits and like nobody was expecting anything to happen so he's totally off his guard and Chakotay literally just reaches one arm out just push like that and he just goes straight in Bam. and then of Splash. course afterwards nobody else sees it nobody else sees it and nobody believes that Chakotay would have done that <laughs> that's why Bilana goes of course you were pushed <laughs> there we go head cannon head cannon so I keep coming up with these really ridiculous examples, like like when the doctor becomes the emergency command hologram and, and Tom says, what I wouldn't give for a whoopee cushion right now because the doctor's so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the examples that I keep coming back I to. I love it. No. I think they're what... I'm not having my deepest evening tonight. Their one-liners are brilliant. One, one that always totally. sticks in my head is um, from 30 Days when he's been in the brig and they've had to do some kind of manoeuvres because of, of the fighting and he's complaining about this other helm officer's flying and all the rest of it. And the doctor's come in to treat him and he's complaining about how badly injured he is. And, and, and the EMH just goes, your injury is what Naomi Wildman would refer to as a boo-boo. <laughs> no, no, that, that's a great scene too because he's also, just, remember he says uh, the, such and such ensign made a brilliant manoeuvre. Yes. <laughs> Flew the ship brilliantly, Tom. You would have loved it. <laughs> love how he's just like taking the opportunity to goad him that's that's interesting yeah kick him while he's down you that know? was it Colhane's brilliant maneuvers almost knocked me unconscious he's just trying to get out of the uh, brig at that point I think oh yeah maybe I should be granted a medical reprieve yeah I do kind of like that though I'm, I'm like what is the doctor thinking saying that to him to, to kind of rib him do you think he's like disappointed with Tom for being in the brig and that's his way of showing that he's disappointed no I don't think so I think it's just trying to lift no. his spirits honestly like you know if you have someone who's in trouble you know just tossing a little friendly banter to lighten yeah. the mood is, I wasn't is, quite sure help, helps the situation whether there was there was both bits of it whether it was just him trying to lighten the mood or whether it was a little bit of him maybe being slightly disappointed with Tom I don't know well, I think that that's the thing, though. I mean, you can be disappointed in Tom, but that doesn't mean they're going to disregard his friendship or lock him no. in the brig forever, right? You know, he's there for 30 days, of course, and they're going to joke about it and it will all be okay Yeah. once they let Ensign Marseille out of the brig. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there is another really nice scene that I thought of, which is actually the beginning of the episode Vis-a-Vis, which is the one where Tom ends up getting taken over by this death character but um right at the very beginning of that episode before any of the sort of stuff that's going to happen starts to go down um we get this scene where uh the doctor walks into the holodeck and tom's working on this car and he, and he's like oh, why yeah. have you not been in sick bay why are you not here like doing your your sick bay training you know you haven't been in for a month and what if what if an emergency happened and tom's trying to say that you know he's he's working on this car and it's a delicate surgery and all the rest of it and he gets the dock in the car and they have a bit of banter about the, the fact that the car's a death trap and maybe that's what's going to land him back in sick bay I know <laughs> it's just great it's just this banter it's brilliant carbon monoxide everywhere yeah. <laughs> so that's just another great one I just I just like that how they just have Tom doing his thing and the, the, the doctor's just totally disregarding any hobby that Tom has is just completely frivolous and pointless and all the rest of it like he does with Captain Unlike the Proton. doctor's hobbies, which are totally meaningful. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, but that's how the doctor sees it, isn't it? Yeah, he's got opera and he's got, you know, Well, it's not an interesting writing. hobby like golf or opera. Yeah. Right. yeah, well, there's the golf incident as well, isn't there? When he's playing ah, golf in there's sick a golf bay. incident. Because um, Balana persuades the Doctor to give over his bit of holodeck time so that Tom and Balana can get their weekend together in the holodeck. The Doctor's complaining about the fact that he's not going to get to play golf and he ends up having to put into cups in yes. sick bay. Tea time in sick bay. It's in drive because it's when um, it's when Tom realizes that he's supposed to be going on this romantic weekend away and actually he's agreed to do this race. And he's like, oh, whoops. And then the doctor's like, uh-oh. Because a race is just as romantic. Yeah. Well, he wasn't going to do it with Bellana at that point, was he? But then he ends up doing it with Bellana, so. No. Yeah. It's kind of weird to picture the doctor playing golf, really. Like, picture this 
golf holiday program and the doctor's playing golf. It's such a just a weird. Image. Well, he also wanted to play golf with Reg when Reg's mm. hologram was. Yes, that's right. There. Yeah. Of all the things you could do on a holodeck, golf is not one of them for me. No. No. He had he has a funky golf club though and like funky flashing balls. Is it supposed to be like some kind of zero G golf, do you think? How would zero G <laughs> golf work? That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, like what what is the hole? Well maybe they have like a sort of net. Maybe or there is no hole. Dun dun dun. Maybe it's all a bit more abstract than that. But it it feels like it needs to be something you could hit from any angle. Couldn't just be a basket, right? It'd have to be like a target. It could still be something that you've got to hit from the right angle, though. A micro wormhole. A micro wormhole. Yeah, because you know we're never gonna have any problems creating <laughs> micro wormholes in the holodeck. <laughs> no, they create themselves. You know. Although my brain has just now written like a scene where the doctor's playing zero G golf on the on the holodeck and he hits his ball into the micro wormhole and then it comes out of a micro wormhole Pops behind out him and in the hits alpha him in the head. <laughs> it hits him in the head. Oh, is so he yes. just like this random golf ball just pops into into existence in the alpha quadrant? <laughs> <laughs> Takes out one of Booth Beast's Aboard a Romulan bushes. ship. Thwacks the Romulan in the head. And then it changes the whole course of the Dominion War. <laughs> that would be amazing. So much for the butterfly effect. We have the golf ball effect The golf now. ball effect. <laughs> this has nothing to do with Tom and no, the Doctor, but, but it, it was just funny. fun. Yeah. I could see Tom playing zero G golf with the Doctor, and he'd probably beat him, much to the Doctor's chagrin. That would be entertaining. And then the Doctor would accuse him of cheating. Oh, definitely. You could totally see how that would go. <laughs> totally. Doctor doesn't believe he could have lost to Tom, so he accuses him of cheating. Can you picture them kind of almost coming to blows with their golf clubs? Yes. Now, would they have sand traps and water hazards in, in zero-G golf? Oh, is it zero-G crazy golf? No, it would be like that fl- It would be like that water planet, just floating <laughs> blobs of water as the water traps. The water plant. It's a giant water hazard. <laughs> yeah, the golf ball can just get stuck in the middle of it. This is brilliant. That's a two-penalty stroke. Or two-stroke penalty. The sand trap is more like a nebula. Like a little, like a little nebula. Little, ne- <laughs> the little nebula in the holiday. Sand traps and floating water planets. And- 3D golf is awesome. You know the 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 sort of fence things that Q makes in in Farpoint when he when he gets those fences that go across. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's for like the out of bounds, that's yeah. for like the rough or whatever. <laughs> I kind of want to make that into a video game like this 3d epic yeah. holodeck golf game joe and tom's zero g, zero crazy g golf. golf yeah could we incorporate lava in there somehow yeah we could get lava in there we have to have lava. i know you're all for a bit of lava aren't you suzanne the floor is made of lava gotta have some lava bunkers <laughs> i love the name joe and tom's zero g crazy golf that sounds like it could be an actual thing only only 80 percent guaranteed to end in concussion <laughs> Well, to kind of bring it back to the more serious side of Tom and the Doctor's relationship then, I've saved this one for the end because I know I said I really like the row that they have later on um, in Author Author, but I, I think on balance maybe this this is my favourite. I'm, I'm toying between the two, but there's a, there's the best scene, I think, really, between the two of them is in real life, which oh, we yeah, did touch absolutely. on a little bit when we talked about real life and, um, and comparing it with uh, The Offspring, but... This, for me, is is a bit of foreshadowing because we see Tom show a maturity here because it's fairly early episode. We're we're in season three. So we see a bit more maturity, I think, in in this from Tom than we actually see until much later on. But I I just love the scene between them in this episode. I, I really, I really love it. This is another example of Tom being able to cut through the Doctor's facade and, yeah, and see, mm-hmm. per- perceive just, what's going on deeply inside the Doctor. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's an incredible episode. We've already talked about the episode at length, so I don't want to talk about that too much, but... Just to kind of glance over over what Tom actually says to him, you know, he's the doctor said that obviously he's he's going to stop going to the program because his daughter's going to die and all the rest of it. But you know, Tom just comes out of nowhere with this incredible speech where he talks about how Voyager has become a family because of of the loss that they faced and what they've left behind and how because of the pain that they've gone through, it's brought them close together. Mm-hmm. And and I think not only does that really epitomise voyager in general i think that really epitomizes tom and the doctor because i feel like they're the kind of people that without being in this sort of situation they probably never would have actually ended up being friends but i think because of the situation that they're in and because they're forced into such close quarters and 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 forced to be living together in a situation where they 
have to confront painful stuff and difficult stuff and personal stuff all of the time and they can't really go to family or other friends and they have to go to each other that they become friends that they wouldn't have become otherwise so i think that's the reason why i love the scene so much for the two of them and there's definitely no lols in there so you're wrong mm-hmm. zach there's definitely not always a lol line in there <laughs> that's true that's an all-around depressing episode for sure that scene is interesting because the doctor is trying to go all computer program on him, right? Like he's trying to just turn off his emotions and be all serious. And, and Tom has to remind him that it's okay to feel, you know, be an emotional being and feel the pain. That and that he wanted the chance to have a family and having a family isn't always, you know, sunshine and roses. There's a lot of heartache that you have to deal with. Yeah. And, and, and that is true. But, you know, he he also sums up it really nicely in the sense that, yes, there is a lot of heartache, but that is essentially what ends up bringing you closer together. That's what knits you together as a unit. And that's just, yeah, it's almost like it's a a bit of a mirror, really, I think, for the the whole theme of Voyagers. And I just love that it's always Tom to convey those messages to the Doctor. I mean, sometimes Captain Janeway can do it with the Doctor, too, but most often it's Tom. Yeah, they're they're great. They're they're a great relationship, and they're probably one of my favourites, I think. Because they are two of my top end characters. You know, they're two of two of the characters that I enjoy watching the most. So to see them interact and to see how how much they kind of bring to to the table for each other. By the end of the run of the show, they're two of the most well rounded characters that we have. Yeah, and I would spend definitely. a few bucks for tickets to the Tom and Doctor comedy hour any day. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Well, it's been fun talking about Joe and Tom's zero-G crazy golf today, but this isn't the only thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, The Ready Room. It was a really great police song, for sure. (laughs) Droxy! Yeah. Yeah, I don't That's know. the I, one where uh, Litter Nimoy was uh, singing backup with Sting on that. Ra- yeah, I can picture Drax scene. Yeah. You don't have to put on it the Xenite. It have to be every seven years. <laughs> <laughs> Standard Orbit. The inscription of this book is a quotation from David Gerald, which is something he said to me in an email. <laughs> and uh, he didn't even remember saying it. I got to, I, I met him recently and showed it to him. And he was like, oh, wow, that's a pretty good quote. I didn't know I said that. I'm like, oh, yeah, you did. <laughs> but he said, the primary philosophy in Star Trek, stripped of everything else, was love one another. I think Jesus might have said something like that once, too. The Orb. When something has lasted... 50, 60, 70 years by the time you use it, it's already overcome that obstacle of being dated. Like, you know that it's going to remain important through the years. And the fact that someone in the 24th century might still be listening to it, I think makes a lot of sense. Warp 5. So we need to hire some samurai to uh, defend us. So they go out. Uh, looking for some samurai, and they find a a, a group of of um, about seven of them. Yeah, like seven samurai <laughs> who are you know maybe down on their luck. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love it if you share your thoughts with us on today's show, and there are many ways that you can do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation with us is in the Babel Conference, our listeners-only discussion group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Just choose Message to a Trek FM Show and select To the Journey. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at Trek FM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek FM. 
Well, speaking of contact information, Suzanne, when you're not busy fishing the doctor's golf balls out of zero-G water traps, where can our listeners find you on the interwebs and around the Trek FM network? Well, you can find me popping up in the Babel Conference. You can also find me on Twitter. My handle is kjaneway8. So, okay, if our listeners have theories about who pushed you into the fetid mud pits of Palomar, how can they reach you? Well, they can find me in the Babel Conference. And if they want to look me up on Twitter, my handle is Choco Weeble. So, Zach, when you're not wasting photonic energy on frivolous pursuits, where can our listeners <laughs> find you? Well, you can find me elsewhere on Trek.fm as co-host of Metatrex, Trek FM show on Star Trek and philosophy, along with my co-host over there, Mike Morrison. You can also find me at the Babel Conference if you'd like to talk about Star Trek and Voyager with me there. And you can find me on Twitter. My handle is just my name, at Zachary Fruling. That's Zachary, Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y, Fruling, F-R-U-H-L-I-N-G. Well, if you'd like to help keep all of our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. The perks you can get include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits and more, all available through our special patrons website, The Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host and distribute these shows each month and we really appreciate any support you can give us, so we hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge the rest of our To The Journey team from around Trek FM. We'd like to thank C. Brian Jones, the founder and publisher of Trek.fm, our executive producers Matthew Rushing and Kenneth Tripp, Aaron Harvey, our art director, Richard Marquez, our production manager, and Brandon Chamutala, our Patreon manager. And we'd like to give a special thank you and a shout out to our associate producers. We'd like to thank Bruce Lish, Ju Kim, Richard Marquez, and our newest associate producer on To The Journey, Patrick Carlin. For those of you that don't know Patrick Carlin, Patrick Carlin provides the energy and the support of To The Journey that keeps us coming back every week. He is such a strong supporter of To The Journey, and we really appreciate your enthusiasm, Patrick. Yeah, we love you, Patrick. Definitely. Thanks, Patrick. We we love all your little tweets and all your little videos that you always send us. So thank you. Join us next week when we're all going to adjust our spectral frequency. But until then, this has been To The Journey. Journey.